Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Deconstructing My Facade question and answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Deconstructing My Facade. Recorded on the 24th of May 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. How are we doing? <laughs> All right, so we're now on to Deconstructing My Facade Q&A, so is your opportunity to ask questions about the previous session. So you want to start, Deidre, and we'll come down the front there, and Pamela on this side, if we start. <coughs> Um, can I ask about the ambulance situation that – can I ask a question no, about that? No, you can't. Okay. No, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was one that got cut away. I, I could feel something coming up and it was pretty big because I had a fight with someone and I was in a city I didn't know and I went to the – looked for a place I could go to. Mm. So I chose a toilet block way in a park. Right. That's why I said it wasn't like in a shopping centre. Yeah, yeah. But um, – and, you know, a passed-by called the police. The yeah. police came. And the nicer he was to me, the more I was you crying. <laughs> like, he was like, it's my job to protect you. And that just set me off. Right, yeah. Because he was just so kind to me. And yeah. then the – he agree, uh, well, I agreed with him to go into the ambulance if they could let me just cry in there. Yeah. Awesome. And it was great. So you got your own private ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pay for it, though. You paid for it, though, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> they're, they're not cheap. <laughs> no, no, it was $90 for the privilege. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That's okay. But – <laughs> but well, I've I'd, sometimes I'd, paid $10,000 for the privilege <laughs> of crying. But, but it didn't even occur to me that that experience might have stopped me even further because when you're looking at me when you said isn't that the reason why you didn't no what i'm suggesting is that you had a situation come up which which was created by your own anger yep of course and there of course the subsequent things have all occurred um as a result of you not dealing with the thing that created your anger in the first place do you see what i'm saying yeah, yeah, when I look yeah. back, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so God's, God's trying to correct that. So, of course, the event will occur. But that's from the choice of not dealing with what you're angry about in the first place. So there's been plenty of previous experiences where a similar thing has happened. You've been angry, not to that extent. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, but you've ignored those events to get to that crisis situation. You follow me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of times when we get to a situation like that, it's because we've ignored a whole seri series of prior events and not been humble to the series of prior events. You follow? Yeah. yeah. Which you know has been the case in this yeah. situation. Yeah. Thanks, um, Pamela. Just checking, um, I thought you said that most of us haven't really started to feel our emotions. So we're really feeling the um, facade or unreal we're just skimming the surface, is that what you mean? I have even gone one step further and I've said to you that most of you have not even yet chosen to accept your facade because when you go into accepting your facade, you will automatically confront... You will automatically confront parents and society. You won't even have to talk to them about it. They will feel confronted. And most of you are not confronting parents in society. That tells me you've yet to even accept your own facade. A person who accepts their own facade automatically confronts parents in society, automatically, emotionally confronted. Parents will wonder what's going on, what's happening with you, what, you know, what's going on in your life, why, why, why do I feel something different from you now, and all those kind of things. And society will start reactions to you straight away. Uh, that's even before you begin kind of deconstructing it. You follow? So let's measure. Let's see. Uh, one of the things I've encouraged each of you to do is to take a scientific approach to your own progress. 
The scientific approach is basically you do something and you measure its result. It's very simple, really. So, so what I'm suggesting is when you accept your facade, the result is going to be automatically a confrontation with parents and society. That's the result. They won't, you won't even have to talk to them. They will feel confronted. They will start approaching you, trying to get you to go back to, to accepting the facade. They will automatically do this. If they're alive on earth, your parents, they will do it, and society around you will do it. You will get pressure, pressure to go back to the state of conformity. Right? If that's not happening, then they think you're already conforming. Do you get that? If, if society and parents are not, are not in a state where they feel you're not conforming, then they believe you are conforming still. If they believe you are conforming still, then what's the most highly likely explanation? It's because you are conforming still. Do you follow? Yes. yes. I was worried because um, uh, <laughs> when I did some emotional work, I was getting good reports, but I think it must have been because I was so under bar <laughs> before that I'm just coming up to... Yeah, no, you, you will also get some positive feedback from people particularly when they notice you becoming a bit more loving and a bit more engaged and a bit more interesting and so forth, you'll certainly get that as well. But to me, that's a part of the measuring process as well. So you may, you'll, you'll see both. But the reality is your parents probably won't like it. You follow me? And that's a very good measure. If your parents don't like it, you're probably progressing. <laughs> I'm on being honest with you. If your parents don't like it, you're probably progressing. Because they have established most of your addictions and most of your, most of your facade, have they not? They've established, they, they contributed a lot to the inception and the conceptions and false beliefs you have. So, of course, when you start deconstructing them, they're going to be the first to complain. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if they're not complaining, I'm suggesting to you, it's highly unlikely you <laughs> are dealing with anything. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. And I mean complaining whether you've said anything to them or not. You, you will feel from them the complaint. You will f and they'll phone you, they'll pest you. Mm. When you're just going through an emotion, disconnecting from one of them, one of them will be on the phone trying to get you to reconnect. Do you follow? Mm. That's what it's, what it's like. It's instant too. As many times that's happened to me, I'll tell you. Start processing emotion about mum and who's on the phone right then and there, mum. You know, Mary's had it too. Starts processing emotion about her dad. Who's on the phone? Her dad. Hasn't spoken to her for years on the phone, right at that moment. You know, next day she processes, uh, this a few weeks ago, she processed an emotion, a few months ago now, processed an emotion about her mother who rocked up the next day at our home and hasn't, we haven't seen her for five years. Her mother. There's proof. That's what happens. They're going to be the first persons who try to shut the whole process down. You can see that, can't you? It's like... And your children. And your children, potentially, yes. Um, particularly if, you've, if they're adults and well -established your, you've well established your addictions in the past with them. But you can't really blame your children, can you? Because uh, you've only taught them to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if we go to Glenda. Um, AJ, I don't feel as if I have confronted my facade. I agree. But I still feel a lot of opposition from my parents in the spirit world. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, they know what, what, what you're trying to do. See, yes. the difference between a, a person on earth and a person in the spirit world is a person in the spirit world can observe you. Go, okay, she's going here and she's going there. She's going to one of those Jesus meetings again. <laughs> Stupid girl. Stupid yeah. girl. What can we do to stop her from going to those things, you know? And, and, and this is how they think. They think they're doing you a favour. Right? Oh, and they've gotten their friends involved in the spirit world as well. I can yeah, yeah. feel yeah, that. Of course yeah. they do. They're bandy, bandy together. One's not enough. Get some more. <laughs> now... Now, with a spirit, they can do that because they can observe your every move, whereas your family on earth can't observe your every move. In fact, a lot of you do moves in private, right? Where nobody knows what you're doing. And some of you even do that with the Divine Truth stuff. 
watch a movie, nobody, my husband's gone, watch a movie. <laughs> Whatever, you know what I mean? And it's a way that you avoid the whole process, you see. But, but you can't avoid it from spirits because they know what your intention is and they know what you're intending to do. So it is likely to ramp up though when I... Um, yeah, real. well, it will get to the point, see, at the moment they believe they can blackmail, bribe you into not doing once they, once they realise they can't, then they just give up. They go, oh, she's a lost cause, <laughs> and move on. You know what I mean? That's what my family have done. Like my family, my, Mary's family pesters us still. My family, they think I'm a lost cause. They leave me alone then. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, it's harder for a spirit, uh, people who are in spirit, uh, from spirit balloon spirit, because they're going to be... Noticing, 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 you know, until such a time as they believe you're a lost cause from an emotional perspective. Yeah, and it does ramp up each time before <coughs> I come to one of these sessions, like I've just spent time in hospital and yeah. it's just coming Physical the, illnesses yeah. where they get yeah. into your body wherever they can, try to stop you from going. You know, people, are, like I've had a lot of people overseas, they, they, they enrol to come to one of these, uh, you know, assistance groups and then the attack begins. And the attack begins and it just goes on and on and on, mostly from spirits, but also from people around them. And eventually they get to the point, they say, they, they write us an email and say, it looks like I'm not meant to come. Sad, hey? So, so in other words, the spirits around them and the people around them know that put a bit of pressure in the right place and they'll then believe this new age type concept. If it's not easy, then I, then I shouldn't do it. And... Um, and that's sad, but, but it is what a lot of well, it happens to a lot of people. Yeah. We've had people enrol, counsel because, you know, they're not meant to come because, you know, all these bad things are now happening. And and that to me that's an indication you're doing the right thing. But but most people don't see it that way, you know. Most people see it as oh all these bad things are happening, I shouldn't go. Maybe there's something evil about that. And that's exactly what the spirits one, you know, here I am talking about love and they want you to believe that it's evil somehow, right? Yeah. I'm of the devil. Right? Yeah. Interesting, given the fact there's no devil. Um, Joanne, thanks. Um, I was going to raise exactly the same issue as Glenda just did. And my mother is putting heaps of pressure on me. I'm pretty sure it's her. Yeah. Um, <coughs> what do I do about that? Well, your mother obviously believes that you will cave to her pressure. So the, the key thing is to develop a strong will to, you know, to even talk to them about the fact that, you know, you're not going to change. You feel it's important that you do these things. And, and the more pressure they put on you, the more you feel like <laughs> you probably should do it. Now, unfortunately, you know, spirits, are, spirits who, are multi uh, who are the past generation of spirits haven't had a long time to develop techniques to attack you you know that and in fact for the majority of them they don't even believe they're attacking you they think they're helping you you know they think yeah. oh my stupid daughter she's doing something again that's a bit stupid you know and and she look she, she looks down from her vantage point seeing all of the things going on and she goes yeah she's just she's she's just gone a bit nutters and i'll i'll fix her up you know i'll just do this and do that and do this and do that and she'll be right so she thinks she d she's doing you a favour. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and there's many people on earth who will, uh, who will attack you, imprison you even, thinking they're doing you a favour. Yeah, I get lots of people emails from people who think they're doing me a favour while they're attacking me, of course. So, so the key is to uh, help them see they're not doing you a favour. Yeah, I, I've, I told her that this morning I had a bit of a talk to her and said, look, I'm going to do this whether you like it or not and you'll <laughs> yeah. see in the end that it's not only going to be good for me but good for you as well and I sort of got this feeling of, hmm, I don't think so but well, see, I would encourage doubt. If you notice our conversations with spirits, myself and Mary's, I always encourage them to find out information that they haven't found out yet. So, so the the Really, it's their fear driving their actions in most cases. Now, that's not the case for malevolent spirits, of course. For malevolent spirits, it's, it's rage and other emotions driving their actions. But for familial spirits, family-based spirits, it's usually fear that's driving their actions. 
And the key to uh, to the what's the antidote to fear? Truth. 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 So so help them come and discover some truth, and they discover truth about the spirit world, discover truth about where they are, and those kind of things, and that helps allay their fears. And then as their fears uh, are reduced, then it makes it a lot easier for you to reason about you know different problems and issues yeah. Mm, yeah yeah i said to her look just come along with me and listen to the talks and i don't know if she's here or not but yeah see see the problem with that is that not only would she not see you got to remember when you come along to these groups there's groups of very very dark spirits who are here as well as groups that are very bright spirits that are here she'd be terrified of the bright spirits as much as she's terrified of the dark spirits yeah so coming here is for her quite a difficult thing you see because she's got all these bright spirits that she thinks you know what are they going to do to me you know they look like they've got a lot of power and then she looks at all these dark spirits and goes well what, all these evil people you know there's all these evil nasty people here as well what are they doing here what's wrong with him why does he attract all that and and, you know, for a spirit looking at all that, a lot of times there's just confusion about why that's happening. Okay, mm. yeah. But again, you can explain why. The bright spirits are the ones who can help you. The ones that are brighter have more love. They've learnt more about love. If you ask them questions, mm. then then you'll be able to see why. And the dark spirits, well, they're the ones who want to attack. They're the ones who are angry. They're the ones who are bitter and twisted still emotionally. And, and, and they are in a lower condition of love. And, and so that's why they're here. They want to attack and harm people. Mm. Do you know I'll, what I mean? I'll talk to her tonight yeah. and tell her that. Yeah, so you, you don't have to, you know, like to me information, truth, is a very, very important part of helping a person grow and change. It's been an important part of helping you, hasn't it? Listening to truth. So think about that with your spirits, the spirits around you that are trying to harm you. Initially, a lot of times when we feel we're being harmed by spirits, our first reaction is anger, and all that does is increase their <laughs> resistance and uh, and and usually increase their attack. Thank you. Mm. If we go, Robert and Jennifer on this side, uh, Alan. If we if we come down to Jennifer on that side. <coughs> Yeah, with the process you went through with um, Rani talking about mm -hmm. practicing to, to get into the um, terror. Yep. Is that a good place for someone like me who doesn't have much faith to actually experiment and grow faith, like in that practice sort of session, like praying and just to stay in it? Is that a place, at all? should I grow faith? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Rob. I'm just mm. having to reflect a bit about what came first for me, whether I had a faith in god i think i still had a faith in god's goodness at that fa at that stage um you know I, over time i learned that um that my you know religious based concepts of god were false and that god was much better than any human and i, I had come to that conclusion and so that helped me have some faith that god is good and so when I was asking God for assistance to help me grow and, 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 and I got certain attractions come to me as a result and one of those attractions was a person who, wanted, who, who uh, I felt was able to help me with experiencing my emotions, um, I decided to embrace that attraction as an expression of, of trust really in the fact that God's led me to that person. Does that yeah, make yeah, sense? Yeah, I get that. And um, because that was in harmony with the direction I knew I needed to go in. Um, and if somebody, and the reality is, if, if somebody came along who tried to stop me from feeling emotion, I would have said, no, that's not in harmony of where I want to go. You know, I don't want to go there. So I don't want your help to help me stop feeling. I want somebody to help me feel because that was my problem. So I feel that uh, you still. You know, developing faith in God is fairly important. And at this stage, how, how would you measure your faith in God? Do you, do you feel you've got much faith in God uh, at this stage? Or? Well, it's growing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like, I feel it has been stronger, but the religious faith sort of it wasn't so much what, what they believed in, it was their actions, you know, that yeah. made me sort of throw it all away. So now I'm sort of having to the actions up. of religious people yeah. caused you yeah. to blame God for their Pretty actions. Pretty much. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. 
um, I, f- I feel like we're starting to get a little bit of faith back. Yeah. 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 yeah that's good. Yeah. And and that uh, to me that uh, what helps a lot there is things like reading truth. You know, like listening to truth, reading truth, particularly truth about God. And you know, there's there's good material about God. Not much of it, but there is good material about God that you can read. Obviously, the Paget messages and the Robert James Lee's books fall into those categories. And since that, so oftentimes that's why I've read them over and over again. You know, I've read both books twenty plus times, all of those books twenty plus times. And the reason why I do that is because I know what's in them. But while I'm reading, it helps me connect to how good God is and reminds me reminds me to have faith in that and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So keep on educating yourself about God too. That helps grow your faith. And the other thing then too is to trust that God's leading you to an emotional process. Like uh, one of the things I learned early in my progression was that once I set my heart to progress in a pure way, what happened was that I started attracting people who helped me feel emotion. And that told me straight away that actually this must mean that God, this is where God's leading me to this state of having that I need to feel emotion at some point, that I need to let go of emotional things. And when I analysed that from an intellectual perspective, I could see logically that it also made sense. So, so both things were in harmony. And so that's why I embraced those particular things as an experiment. I wouldn't have embraced them if I felt God wasn't leading me there, but, but I felt God was because of the, both the logic and the fact that once I set my desire, these things came to me. And so I trusted those things that came to me. And then I experimented with that. And then the experimentation caused the growing faith as well. So the, the more I released an emotion, the better I felt, the better I felt, the more loving I became. And, and so there was a relationship between those things that I could measure and in measuring those particular things that helped me grow stronger faith. Now I had a stronger faith, I did it more. So it's sort of like a snowball effect after that. Mm. So that's what I'd recommend, the same kind of process. And, you know, it, a lot depends on who you associate with too. It really does. You know, there's a, the Bible verse, I think it's in... Uh, First Corinthians or something like that. It says uh, bad associations spoil useful habits, right? And 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 above it, it says do not be misled. Bad associations spoil useful habits. And and this is the thing: is there's a lot. I, I noticed in my progression that there were once I set my intention to feel emotion, there were people around me who tried to stop me from doing it. My mother was one in particular, and my fa- mother, father, brother and quite a number of others who were close to me, they tried to stop me from feeling emotion. And straight away I felt, well, no, if, if this is where I want to go, then from God's definition, these are not good people to associate with while I want to go in that direction. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, that helped me also uh, realise that, that if, I could, if I could spend time or find people, and they were very hard to find, but if I could find people who were at least wanting or desiring a connection with emotion, they were the people who spent a bit more time with. And uh, as it turned out, there were very few of those, so I spent most of my time alone. But, but, but you have people around you who want that, so um, you, know, you spend more time with those people. Just naturally spend more time with them in a natural setting because just being with them, their openness to emotion allows awarenesses that weren't there before. You know? Yep, yep. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thanks a lot. Yep. Good. Jen. Thank you, OJ. As you know, there's a lot of doubt, there's a lot of faith issue <coughs> and it, there's a lot of it that goes back to my father. Mm-hmm. Sorry, this is a question of faith and, um, and dealing with my stuff with my father. My father is like a broken record. He still wants me to be the little girl that I was when Jen, I was a kid. You still want him in your life, though, Jen. <sighs> I don't speak to him. Yeah, but you want him yeah. to change. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a big problem. Yeah, it is You huge. see, what, what happens is we're still emotionally connected to a person we want to change. No matter whether we're spending time with them or not, emotionally we're spending time with them. 
we want we want them to change for a reason and the reason is usually to meet an addiction that they created so so you're not prepared to emotionally give that up mm. and then that, that what that means then is that you're you're desirous of their change and and the only reason why you've stopped associating is because they won't mm. <laughs> right and that's not the reason to stop associating with a person I feel. I feel the reason to stop associating with a person is because they're being unloving to you, which I, I know is one thing that he's mm. doing. But, mm. but, but you still have the desire that he changes and mm. you've got to release the desire that he changes from you. You've got to let go of him. When you let go of him, he'll start, he'll start trying to find you. <laughs> okay. Do you understand? It's like, uh, see, at the moment, see... In, uh, incestuous codependent addictions, which are the addictions between parent and child. So if you've got a parent, your father in this case, you've got you, the child in this case, an incestuous emotional connection means that when you truly break the connection, can somebody turn off that phone, thanks? Um, once you break this connection, sorry, go on, I know that's embarrassing, but thanks. Um, the uh, once you break that connection, his his addiction, his addiction is still and is now not getting met. So his addiction is to feel powerful over you, to feel like he ne you need him, that you need him to survive, and all these different addictions, right? That he has with you, he wants those addictions to remain. So when you break those addictions yourself, that you don't need a man to survive, and you don't need daddy to look after you, and you don't need those things, he will feel it in his heart. He will feel that you've now done something, and he, as an indication that you've now done it, he will start to try to get you back to where you were feeding his addictions. Do you understand? Yes. He will try to make you feed the same addiction as before. right? And, and that's an indication that you've addressed your addiction with him. Do you follow? Uh, yes, I think so. Because it's codependent addiction. If you think of it, he's got a hole in his soul, like a big vortex. We talked about the vortex a few days ago. Big vortex in his soul where he needs certain things from his daughter, right? You have a vortex in your soul that you need certain things from daddy, right? While you need those things from daddy, his vortex is fulfilled. Okay. Got it. Yes. The energy is flowing from your soul to his soul. He is satisfied doesn't matter whether you talk to him or not he's still satisfied when you close down the the vortex by feeling the pain of it right by feeling the different pains that'll close down your feeding his addiction right your needs for him in other words you've now closed down your own addictions and you no longer will feed his he will feel that he will try to re-establish those addictions without fail they will try to re-establish the addiction. Right? I, I have not yet, a met, yet met a parent who doesn't try. You know, it's phone calls, written letters, whatever, you know, talking to the other children about you in order to make you conform. And there's all sorts of methods they will use to get you back into the same place. This is an indication that you're working in the right direction. Does that Thank make sense? Yep. Can I ask? Yes. The rest of my family don't talk to me. Yep. How how would that tie in? Why don't they? When and when didn't they? In my thirties, I started confronting my father. I started deciding I didn't want to live in the pretense of denial that the whole family was living in. Yep. And and they um, all took dad's side. They all took dad's side. Yep, my so mother and me were the only ones, and my brother, and he's died since. Yep. So it was mum and me, yeah. and my mother was still living in and out of denial about yeah. what was going on yeah. as well. So, so how does this yeah. relate to deconstructing your facade again? Can I? Oh, can you see you've gotten now really into the story, Jennifer, and lost the point of? Oh our no! Discussion? Well, the question was originally in regards to faith. I remember last time yep. in the in the last group, first group, that developing faith. You're telling a story, not asking a question now. Oh, so tell me, what's okay. the question? Okay, um, 
what else can I do? Other, you've already mentioned it, actually. You probably answered it. I need to deal with my pain in yes. regards now, to my father and now, my Now, can you Is see what's correct? driving you now? Am I in addiction? Yep, you are. Why? Okay. What's driving you now? You said you said now just now that you already knew based on our discussion. Uh, no, there. I wondered if there was anything else I could do in regard in regards to developing my faith. I'm pretty sure I need to do the stuff with my father, and I wondered if that was all. If there was something more I can do, can you see? You just need reassurance from me, a man, because you don't have the reassurance from Daddy anymore. You said that last time, and I guess I'm not, yeah, and I'm not, sh yeah, but I'm not seeing that in this instant. I know you're not. Yeah. I know you're not. But for me to say it twice now, in a row, mm -hmm. is an indication that perhaps there's quite a large addiction there that you don't see. And this is what yeah. I'm saying to you, is drawing you to your dad. This is what I'm saying. He's still getting satisfied what he needs satisfied from you. You're desperate for it, and and when you projected to me, all you're doing is projecting what, at me what you projected at your dad. So he's not disconnected from you, and you're not disconnected from him. I have a sense that I'm not disconnected from him, but that's all it is. It's like, and I'm telling you why, but you won't, re you won't listen. So, okay. so really let's move on. So I need to. Let's move on. Yep. Okay. It's okay. You're allowed to not listen, Jen. Judith. Hi. Um, can the difference between your real self and facade be kind of quite subtle that you can't really distinguish? Because I had an experience last year where I felt I connected to God, and I can't see that much difference with what I was at that moment and what I am now. I know I'm nervous around people and that, but... I remember I said that many of you have, have had the instantaneous, some, some very rare moments where you've actually connected to your real self and felt something for God and actually received something from God. The problem is they're very rare moments. And the reason why they're very rare moments is because of the facade, which is very different from your real self, very different. And, and what we hope to do in the next few days after this, after this discussion about removing your unloving self, we want to focus your attention a bit more on how to identify your real self more and, and those kind of things. So we'll be answering some of those questions in that. So, so yes, your facade is very different from your real self, but there are aspects of your real self that poke their way through everything. Your real self, your, your soul is like, um, for example, many of you have chosen jobs in the past that actually have a smidge of your real self in them, right? And that if you had purified the real self, real self's desire and got rid of the facade, you might have embraced those jobs with a lot more passion and desire and had a lot more success. Do you see what I'm saying? So there are times when the real self pokes through, but unfortunately it's not very often. <laughs> yeah. And plus I also kind of lack faith that the experience actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, one thing I see a lot of people doing is they have an experience with God and then they don't trust it. So that, that's an issue in itself, isn't it? Um, we need to be able to, if, we're, if we were scientists approaching this process, we would, we would probably write down the experience, wouldn't we? And we'd say, right, I've got to remember that experience because that was an experience where I tried something, I had this result, and that was very interesting. I've got to remember these events. Initially, remembering them is quite difficult because your motivations are, listen to the terror, avoid the pain. And so remembering events that build faith when you really don't want faith is, is difficult. But once you change and you really want to have some faith, you will remember the experiences that have built your faith from the past. And some of them have even happened before, way before you've met anything to do with divine truth. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? You, you all deconstructed my facade of doubt. <laughs> Yeah, there's still this feeling, isn't there, when it comes to this subject, closing down, isn't there? It's just, I think, I think what's going to have to happen is for you to settle, you know, have the next few months to experiment with some of these things we're talking about and, and ask questions then.
send in your questions to the FAQ channel and ask your questions then about, you know, about what's going on and what to do. Because it, it feels to me that when we get to this subject, it's a tough subject to present to you guys because it, it, it always ends up with quite a lot of emotional shutdown. And so that tells me that fear is still dominating for many of you, very, very much dominating. And this incessant need to understand before you do is, is quite high. You know, this, this big thing of I want to know all the intricacies of it. Like, I, I didn't ask anybody anything, <laughs> really. Like, someone helped me feel some emotion, so I went there and he didn't, he didn't talk to me. He just put his hand on some parts of my body and I just bawled. <laughs> That's all we did. Do you know what I mean? He didn't talk to me, he didn't convince me. And then I got to the point where I couldn't feel emotion with him anymore and, and I, I don't know what happened there. You know, I didn't know at the time, I mean, what happened there. And then I worked out, well, actually now I'm hitting the points where my will is to not feel certain things. So I had to allow myself to work through that particular thing. But honestly, we need, we need to have these experiences to actually learn the truth about these things. And, and still, even after six or seven years for many of you, you're not convinced that feeling emotions is the way forward. And in fact, what I notice is almost that everybody who leaves Divine Truth puts out there on the net and all that kind of stuff, you know, all this channeling about, no, it's not emotion, you don't have to feel emotion and all this stuff. You know, they're all very focused on the emotional side and not feeling. And, and you know, this is very, very interesting. I find it very interesting how the main motivations of pretty much everybody who leaves Divine Truth is to convince, convince you that you don't have to feel emotion. Yeah. And that tells me that actually there's a lot of pressure on you to not embrace humility, to not go into the state of feeling your emotions. Yeah. It's an essential part of deconstructing your facade, feeling the emotions. You, and there's two groups of emotions you'll need to feel. One group, the desire-based global emotions, you know, faith, truth, desire to feel emotion. And the other group is the negative emotions, the ones that restrict you, the ones that, the ones that are all driven by your terror. You know? Those emotions have to be felt so that they can be lowered. And what I love about the way God's designed the whole process is that the way you increase desire is by feeling it and the way you decrease fear is by feeling it. Isn't that so simple? <laughs> Uh, all you have to do is feel, and if it's, a, if it's an emotion that's in harmony with love, it will grow. grow. And if it's an emotion out of harmony with love, you, it will die. die. Huh. How clever is that? <laughs> it is clever, isn't it? It is so clever. And, and this is what you feel after a while about God's laws and the way God's designed everything. It's so clever, so clever, so simple and yet so clever. And, um, and, and it gives you a lot more appreciation for the amount of design of these laws that, that impact upon the human soul. Because you know, when it comes to our next session, we want to talk to you about some of these laws that impact upon the human soul. And once you start realising through these experiments that actually choosing to be humble causes positive growth and desire to grow as well as causing the destruction of anything that's out of harmony with love at the same time and it's like how clever is that like normally you'd have to do two different things right you'd think but you don't it's just wonderful so so i sort of see i sort of see what god's designed as remarkable really you know the way the way he's designed it but of course, you're only probably going to feel that way once you've been through a bit of it, aren't you? Once you've been through a bit of it, Diane, thanks. Um, I have a question mm -hmm. uh, um, regarding um, uh, in the in the times when um, I look at that intellectual deconstruction process mm -hmm. for some of my big addictions. Um, 
what I've discovered um, is that uh, in my, if I'm sincere, I will connect with something and I'll have some emotional response um, in relation to what feels like truth that I'm recognising. Yep. Um, is that, am I like just doing a little skip into towards the emotional process or what is actually happening when that happens? Yeah, the problem with describing processes to you is that there's a temptation for you to then um, attempt to see it as a fragmented process. But, but it's not actually. It's quite a seamless process, the way God's designed it. So the reality is that you can go from intellectual denial right the way through intellectual awareness and right into emotional awareness and then and, and emotional denial and then right into emotional awareness. The, take the whole, you can do the whole thing on a single emotion quite seamlessly, depending upon how complex the emotion has been to create. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so the reality is you can pass through these periods within seconds or minutes um, and into a state of awareness. Of course, the more uh, difficult the emotion, the more highly unlikely that is to occur because you'll have all these little blockages and protections and all these little, you know, so you have all these addictions first, you've got to deconstruct and you'll have all these protections and so forth. And so... So the more difficult the emotion, the more painful the emotion, mm. the more likely it is that you'll feel the process is a more fragmented process because you've got all these blockages to undo as a part of the process or an experience. But in some cases where there's not many of those, you, you can go through from that one state right the way through to the other in the space of hours or less. And uh, when that happens, of course, it's lovely. But it's not going to happen very often because most of our pain ha is quite complex in the way that it's being created, you know, and we have to deconstruct the complexity as a part of the process. Now, God's willing to expose every part of the process, help you with every part of the process, but he's not going to do it without your will sincerely engaged. Yeah, so it's going to require a sincere desire in the soul before it will happen yeah i mm. i noticed that it, it's related to sincerity and my resistance at that next bit where i yep. just the emotion stops yeah and um my i can feel my desire i can feel my heart open mm -hmm. in that space mm -hmm. and then um i can only feel it for so i only allow myself to feel it for so for long time. Yeah, because my fear of overwhelm might be any one of those number of things. and then mm -hmm. Many of you yeah. close down good emotions. Oh, like yeah. Sometimes uh, crying when you just feel overwhelmed with God's love is, 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 is so powerful for most of you that you, you only feel it for a few, few seconds. You remember I had a discussion in the last group with Elvira, that's right it was, yeah, and how, about how she was doing that. Allowing it to flow, stopping it straight away. Allowing it to flow, stopping it straight away. Many of you do that because you're not used to the power of emotion. You, you know, is, is it part of this process, remember, remember we use the word desensitization to emotion, which is about your facade, what your point of your facade. One of its points is to desensitize yourself to emotion. Right. So, so that tells you, or it should tell you, that the opposite is the goal, to sensitise yourself to emotion. Yeah? And, and sensitising yourself to emotion, for some of you, you're going to find it pretty hard. And for many of you men, you're going to find it hard too. You know, you've been taught to desensitise yourself. Many of you ladies will find it hard in the emotion of terror. Many of you men will find it very difficult with the emotion of grief. So, you know, it just depends on what type of emotions we've been desensitised to. And the genders have been desensitised to different emotions. And, and the more the goal of the facade, desensitising to emotion, has to be undone. So we need to become sensitive to emotion. Becoming sensitive to emotion, you could say, is actually humility. So what, basically what we're saying is you have to become humble. Right? That's really what we're saying. You need to become humble and 
by becoming humble, you will work through many of these issues. And as, as you work through these issues, because you're now humble, you will see the facade and what it's created and the pain it's created and its sin and so forth. You will see it. You'll accept it as a result of you being humble. You will say, this is where it is and this is how, how it's happened, what's happened to me. But once you've accepted it, so now, now you're accepting it, you're understanding it better, but you're still not removing it. You have to engage the process, part of the process we've talked today and tomorrow we'll talk about the rest. That's the process you need to engage to remove it. Right. So that's about understanding. I've got some big emotions, global emotions. I've got some bit smaller emotions, but multi-event emotions. And then I've, and remember, the global emotions I might n not even be related to a single event. They might be multi-generational global. And then the multiple emotions, they will be related to events. And the single event emotions, they will be related to events. So you need to allow yourself to remember, allow yourself to emotionally work your way through. And then once you do that, you can see that you're now getting closer to, to actually deconstructing the pain part of your life. Right? So the first part's deconstructing the facade part of your life. The second part's deconstructing the pain part of your life, releasing the pain. So we'll talk to you tomorrow morning about releasing the pain. Anyway, I am 10 minutes over, so we need to finish. So, um, so what we'll do tomorrow is uh, we'll be talking about releasing the pain. There'll be some more feedback sessions. Now, Cornelius has put up the back for you, um, the two books again for the second session's feedback. So if you want to get some feedback on a certain issue, um, uh, put the issue in the, one of those two pink folders um, up the back. And uh, tomorrow morning, as I say, we'll be talking to you specifically about releasing the pain and the process of release of the pain, which is actually quite a simple process in comparison to what we've discussed today. So, so um, not that today wasn't simple, it was just <laughs> hard to do. <laughs> just hard to do. So uh, we'll catch you tomorrow morning. Thanks for today, guys. Can I just ask you to do one thing tonight for me, and that is to work out why you're a bit more resistive today. You've also been projecting at me today a feeling that uh, if you don't understand, it's my fault. <laughs> so my suggestion is to have a look at that. Does that make sense? Can you feel that in you? Because that's a feeling that you get pretty strong about when you get resistive and feel like you can't really grasp something. Right? When you don't understand, it's your teacher's fault. So my suggestion is that it covers over a feeling that it's your fault and for you to have a look at that. But, but just have a feel about those two, those particular issues, if you can. We, w tomorrow would be great if we could get... Because uh, a lot of our celestial friends haven't been able to help you today. Uh, they were the first two days, a bit more connected. Today, not so much. So, so, so my suggestion is you have a look at what's come up in terms of resistance so that, so that you can try to reverse that as an audience tomorrow so you can be a bit more open. Sound good? <laughs>